So I'm going to tackle the topic, topic of fipronil resistance urban myth. And I thought a good way to start would be to define what an urban myth is. This is, this is something that is a story that's generally untrue, but maybe contains a nugget of truth. But the truth has become um, assimilated or exaggerated into the, into the myth around it, so that it's actually difficult to extract one from the other. And I'm particularly interested in this uh, to try and distill down to what, what truth there is, because I've been hearing this story for over five years, and it's very difficult to tell where, where the nuggets of truth are. So what I'd love to do today is to stimulate discussion about, about um, the situation. What I want to do in the, in the presentation is briefly, first of all, look at um, a, an overview of flea resistance, and then to look um, at the current status, whether we're looking actually at resistance, or at poor compliance, or at what I'm calling exaggerated expectations. And then I want to move on to look at preventing and managing um, resistance to conclude. In terms of definitions of resistance, um, there, are, there are many. I've chosen this one from the pesticide literature, and probably the pesticide literature is, is better developed um, than the, than the veterinary um, insecticide literature in, in many regards. Um, and I'll allude back to that a little later on. So this definition is uh, that resistance is a genetic change in response to selection by toxicants that may impair control in the field. Now, the chap on the left here you might recognize, this is Mike Rust from the University of California, and he is probably the father, um, not literally I hasten to add, the father of modern day flea biology understanding, um, of flea control understanding, and of flea resistance. So he, he is a, 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 really, a real cornerstone to this field. In terms of his understanding of resistance in fleas, he acknowledges that cat fleas have shown a propensity to develop resistance to insecticides, <coughs> especially to the cyclodienes, carbamates, organophosphates, and pyrethroids. And he goes on to say that the veterinary community is in an ideal position to recommend and deliver pest management of fleas with an eye towards the management of insecticide resistance. And being from America, he probably has a, an increased overview of resistance because it's from America that most work has been done and probably the, the selection pressure has, has been the most. Moving back away from fleas themselves to think about what mechanisms do insects as a, as a whole show in terms of um, resistance mechanisms, the, there, are, there are a number. And those include changes to the insecticide target. And that is particularly possible where you have an insecticide that is designed very specifically to target a particular place within an insect, a particular um, a tar target molecule. And if that insect is able to change that molecule in some way, then quite possibly it's no longer susceptible to the effect of the insecticide. Other mechanisms include changes to the penetrating ability of insecticides, so the insect in some way doesn't allow the penetration of the insecticide uh, so much, or even behavioral changes have been recorded. So insects learn how to circumnavigate, if you like, um, exposure to insecticide. 
So there's a variety of potential resistance mechanisms. And indeed, where there is resistance, there can be more than one mechanism at work. And so um, resistance in um, pests in a greenhouse, aphids or something like that, could be due to coexistence of several resistance mechanisms, not necessarily just one. And equally, the, the degree of resistance that's present can vary very much according to the mechanism. So, for instance, you can have a mutation that confers a small level of resistance that really would go absolutely unnoticed um, in, in the field in, in terms of control. Or you can have a change that creates a really profound block on insecticide activity. And, and that can then render an insecticide um, ineffective in, in that situation. I want to move on now to look at what we know of in the UK and what we know of in terms of flea resistance in the UK are relatively few small pieces of information at the moment. It's by no means a, a complete picture at all. What I want to start with is to look at resistance associated mutations. So these are changes within the um, genetic structure of fleas that have been identified in, in the UK. And I want to go through these um, in turn. So there's something called RDL, KDR, and then SKDR. So the RDL mutation stands for resistance to deodorant. And that's one of the, deodorant is an old substance that was probably around decades ago, wasn't, as far as I'm aware, used for flea control, but was used as an environmental um, insecticide. And that has created, in, in some insects, a, a mutation that has reduced the effectiveness of deodrin, hence the the name RDL. Now, in some flea populations in the UK, some wild flea populations, that same mutation has been identified. And so that's, that's shown here. Um, this was work by Bass and others in, published in 2004. Here you see this is RR, resistant resistant for this genotype. Um, homozygote, heterozygote here, and then sensitive, sensitive here. And you see within this population, um, and I want to um, emphasize that this was a small population, and probably because this type of work is really expensive. So this is a small sample that they looked at within this population. About half were homo homozygous resistant, about half were heterozygotes, and then there were some susceptibles as well within this population. However, our, the significance of RDL, um, the RDL mutation is controversial. The RDL um, mutation apparently has cross-resistance or confers a degree of cross-resistance to fipronil. However, other investigators, illustrated here, um, Brunet et al., looked at a number of US laboratory strains of flea, and you can see the strains here, TRS, Vertex, and KS1, and looked at the efficacy of um, fipronil administered um, and assessed immediately <coughs> after treatment, so here on day one or two after treatment administration against fleas, and then again at 
the end of the month, so <coughs> 29.30. And here you can see very good efficacy right the way through. And these investigators looked at looked for the presence of the RDL mutation in each of these flea strains, and they found it. And so in other words, the RDL mutation is not either reducing immediate post-treatment efficacy in these laboratory strains or month-end efficacy. However, you may have noticed that I didn't point to that one. And what you can see here is something in this KS1 strain of a reduced efficacy at, at month-end. Now this KS1 strain is uh, a well-established, uh, isolated laboratory strain that shows a number of peculiar peculiarities. And so, for example, fipronil, efficacy as per the last slide, efficacy at day 29, 30, 81.4%. In this strain, imidacloprid at day 29, 30, 72.6%. Now, those are well-established figures, but the rationale for those is unknown. And so there's a great deal that's not understood in, in terms of how what the fleas are doing, even in these very well-established um, strains. Coming back from the US to the UK, KDR and SKDR, KDR is knockdown resistance and SKDR is super knockdown resistance and that's to pyrethroids. And this, you'll notice, was done by the same group as um, the RDL survey. And you can see here, UK wild fleas, KDR, 57% resistant homozygotes in, in this sample. And the SKDR, 22% were resistant homozygotes. Now, what that means in real terms, in terms of pyrethroid efficacy, is, is not um, clear, because these authors did not go on to then test these, these leads with pyrethroid. What else do we know from the UK? Well, there is one set of monitoring going on, and this is the only monitoring that I'm aware of. Um, each year, Bayer conducts an imidacloprid monitoring survey, and some of those samples come annually from the UK. That survey consists of three eggs collected from uh, veterinary practices, and they go into an assay, and that assay is actually a larval development assay where they've incorporated in the decloprid at what's called a discriminating dose. So that discriminating dose should kill susceptible fleas. Um, and so it should only be tolerant fleas that, that continue to develop having eaten that um, larval, larval food impregnated with the decloprid. And to date, there haven't been reports of um, anything surviving <coughs> that discriminating dose, as, as far as I'm aware. So that's a quick overview of what we know about resistance in the um, UK. So very sparse few pieces of information. So I want to go on now to begin to ask the question, are we actually looking at resistance, where people are saying things don't work, or are we looking at poor compliance, or are we looking at what I'm going to call exaggerated expectations? I'm going to start with the last of these, and my hypothesis is that resistance is actually reached by elimination of those other two um, possibilities. So elimination of compliance failure, elimination 
of exaggerated expectation, and then you get to possibly suspected resistance. And I think that route is very important. So first of all, exaggerated expectation. If you go to um, the regulatory literature about the guidance given to people wanting to produce a flea product to put onto the market in Europe, you'll see that the efficacy of the, the proposed product should be approximately 100%. That's what's, what's written. In, term, in working terms, this is that a mean of 95% um, efficacy should be achieved based on arithmetic means, both immediately after treatment and also at the far end of however long that protection is designed to be for. And of course, for many of the flea control products, that, that would typically be a month. So you'd be looking for 95% efficacy in laboratory studies at the end of that month period. So what does, how does that translate into reality? Well, if you've literally got 100 fleas and 95% must die within 48 hours, that means that five may, may remain alive. Alternatively, in the situation of a very heavy environmental infection, um, you might have a situation where there are 100 fleas at the time of treatment. They all die within 48 hours. And then another 100 fleas come out of the environment, and so it looks as though there's been absolutely zero effect um, if you were to look at, at 48 hours later. And that, of course, is in the home or the kennel environment, and that's in contrast to these laboratory studies where the fleas are very carefully placed on and then removed after the 48 hours, and so you're not going to get an environmental challenge happening in, in those studies. Other things that may lead to exaggerated expectations being disappointed are that the speed and rate of flea emergence from the environment is very highly dependent on environmental conditions. And the example I'm giving here is really the extreme one. So in a lot of situations, you wouldn't have an environmental um, infestation taking up to 174 days to emerge from the environment as adult fleas, but it can happen. And if you imagine 174 days and you treat for one month or even two months cover, 60 days is way short of 174 days. And so you could get a situation there where it looks like a failure of efficacy but actually it's the environment that hasn't been um, considered sufficiently. Another feature of the environment that can catch um, can flea control out is of course the pupil window, where you have pupae and pre-emerged adults that are wonderfully protected in the environment by crawling down to the base of, of carpets or um, cushions or, or wherever in, in the household to very protected environments where they're, un they're unlikely to be affected by um, topical insecticides possibly in that location and equally they're, they're not going to be affected by at that stage probably by the juvenile hormone analogues or, or similar things like that. And of course, then you have the situation where um, a house is um, empty or the environment isn't disturbed for a period. And then those adult fleas can just sit around and wait for considerable periods in that pupil co cocoon, waiting for evidence of um, a suitable host being present. And then, of course, they'll, they'll come out. So all of those things, and I'm sure you can come up with many more examples um, yourselves, could lead to an owner going, this, this hasn't worked. 
Moving on to looking at um, poor compliance, products really truly only have a chance of working if they're applied correctly. So I'm, again, I'm sure that you all have examples of this. Spot-ons administered in the food or down the ear. Those aren't going to work, obviously. Equally, the dosing must be accurate based on the size of the pet. And where necessary, repeat treatments should be given at the recommended interval. Now, my guess is that given the um, financial constraints right now, people may be compromising on one or other of, of these. Um, so giving half the dose to save some for next time sort of thing. Or just extending that into treatment interval just a little bit to make things last a little bit longer. And in doing that, they may just be giving the opportunity for fleas to the flea life cycle to, to continue. Another possible um, poor compliance situation is that most flea control products suggest that where there's a heavy environmental challenge, uh, a suitable environmental uh, treatment is, is also used. And that all cats and dogs in the household are, are also treated. And again, if these things aren't, aren't done, then potentially there's opportunities for the flea life cycle to, to continue. Now, there isn't very much um, information that, I, that I'm aware of that looks to see how much um, this happens and how profound an effect it can have. I found one Australian study, though, where they, um, the investigators looked at 30 households where there'd been a flea control uh, breakdown, a control breakdown problem. And when they looked very carefully at these households, they found that actually 23 of the households, so that's something like two-thirds or so, were found, were found to have been non-compliant in terms of possibly not treating all the animals in the, in the household. <coughs> so in this situation, that's a really major component of um, treatment failure. In the same study, the investigators went on to look in detail at the animals within those households. So. On day naught of their study, they found that 23 of 47 animals had fleas on them in that in that household, in those households. They conducted a questionnaire, <coughs> did flea counts, a white sock check, so they very bravely put white socks on and walked around those houses. They gave management instructions and they provided treatment for application on days 0, 30, 60, and 90. And subsequently, when they came back to look at those households, of the 25 households that continued up to day 90, 23 were fully free by day 90. And that, to me, suggests that where there's a real focus on um, management um, of the problem, then quite often it may be that the problem is, is controlled by good management and attention to detail. <laughs> so that's exaggerated expectations and poor compliance. Just asking the question how, how many of these reports relate to one or other of those two situations. And of course, if those are um, investigated, ticked off, then you, you may be left with the question of uh, resistance. How can you assess that? Well, monitoring, as I described earlier, you can survey regularly to see whether there's evidence of resistance to insecticides or not. Or cases of um, apparent treatment failure can be investigated to either confirm or eliminate uh, resistance. So the way that you can go about doing that is to 
carry out a, an adulticidal assay. And typically these are assays where you have a, a series of concentrations of the insecticide and an untreated um, um, environment as well, typically a, a, a jar or similar. And a number of adult fleas from the, from the suspect population are placed into those different, different concentrations, left for perhaps 24 or 48 hours. And then the mortality at each concentration can be checked against mortality in those untreated control um, containers. And that begins to address whether there is um, a treatment failure related to tolerance of the product or, or not. Now I want to move on to the final section of this presentation to look at preventing and managing resistance. And prevention is definitely a, a very good thing, as Groucho Marx um, acknowledged. However, I'm standing here without all the answers about how to go about that. I can, I can tell you... Um, prevent getting cut to avoid uh, needing bandages and so on. I can, I can tell you that one. I don't have all the answers for preventing um, flea insecticide resistance. I can tell you that probably applying the principles that have now been fairly well worked out for um, control of Antimintic resistance amongst worms of horses probably won't translocate, um, at least not directly. So refugia for um, horse um, nematodes has become uh, quite a, a well-known concept where some horses or for periods of time animals aren't treated and the level of infection there is, is monitored, for example. However, if you applied that principle to flea control, you'd come head to head with some conflicting interests. Um, I don't think many households would accept that one animal could have fleas and they'd just control it on the others, or that part of the animal they treat and tolerate some fleas on another part of the animal. In actual fact, when we're talking about flea control, we're talking about pushing a population to extinction within a household environment. And so we've got zero tolerance there. And so maintaining a susceptible genetic pool within a household is not going to be um, tolerated. Another aspect why um, preserving some fleas within an environment would not be tolerated is that we know that a very good way of producing <coughs> FAD, uh, the allergic um, disease, is, is actually intermittent exposure. And so an idea of having a few fleas around, or for part of the time, really isn't, probably isn't a very good idea at all. There are various strategies that can be used um, again, alluding back to the pesticide field that can be used to prevent resistance, and they include using mixtures. And of course, there's examples of that where commercial preparations have been, been created that target different parts of the flea life cycle. So those, the concept there of integrated control, are implementing those, those ideas. Alternatively, there's alternation, and then, of course, there's, there's management being in, integrated as well. However, the danger with those strategies is that if they're inappropriately thought through, they can actually select for resistance better than doing nothing at all. And so these things need to be very carefully um, thought through. In terms of managing resistance, First of all, identify it, confirm it, report it. Of course, each of the producers of 
uh, fleet control products have a responsibility to keep a log of both safety um, issues and, all, and to investigate them and also apparent efficacy failure issues. So it's important that they're reported and then control the infestation. And to control the infestation where it is resistance, it would then be sensible to choose an insecticide from a different class to, to switch. And here I stepped back across to an organization called IRA, which are involved with pesticide um, control of resist resistance to pesticides in the agricultural and horticultural arenas. And they've developed a mode of action classification, which I've summarized here. If you Google, if you're interested and you're not aware of it, if you Google IRAC, uh, you'll find the full um, table there. And so in this example, if you've had a problem with control using a product from group one, you could sw switch to group two or group three, and then you would expect to be able to achieve control. The IRAC classification continues on to look at the juvenile hormone analogues and so on. So it's, it's a very complete classification that, that can be very useful. So choose unrelated products where there is um, confirmed resistance until the, the problem is eradicated. So to conclude, I, I think it's um, absolutely critical in this arena that we deal appropriately to identify exaggerated expectation, poor compliance, and then resistance. That we really treasure our current ectoparasiticides. Doesn't matter what they are or how long they've been around for, we can't anticipate that the next one is around the corner. So we really have to look after what we've got and not try and push it to extinction. I think another thing that would be really useful is that the interested parties within this whole arena communicate and work together to identify whether there is a problem and what we should be doing to both prevent and manage resistance appropriately in, the, in this area. And finally, that we should disassociate any myth so that we can see reality and begin to manage it. I want to close by going back to what Mike Russ said. The veterinary community is in an ideal position to recommend and deliver pest management of fleas with a weather eye towards the management of insecticide resistance. That's really key. Thank you very much.